Imad ad Din Muhammad ibn Qasim Ath Thakafi Arabic, Mad al Din Mehmd bn al Qasim al Thakafi c. 695-715 was an Umayyad general who conquered and controlled the Sindh till Multan along the Indus River for a short period of four years for the Umayyad Caliphate. He was born and raised in the city of Taif in modern-day Saudi Arabia. Qasim's conquest of Sindh up to southernmost parts of Multan enabled further Muslim conquests on the Indian subcontinent. A member of the Thaqif tribe of the Taif region, Muhammad bin Qasim's father was Qasim bin Yusuf, who died when Muhammad bin Qasim was young, leaving his mother in charge of his education and care. Umayyad governor al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf al Thaqafi, Muhammad bin Qasim's paternal uncle, was instrumental in teaching Muhammad bin Qasim about warfare and governance. Muhammad bin Qasim married his cousin Zubaydah, al Hajjaj's daughter, shortly before going to Sindh. Due to his close relationship with al Hajjaj, bin Qasim was executed after the accession of Caliph Sulayman ibn Abd al Malik. Umayyad interest in Sindh According to Burzan, Umayyad interest in the region occurred because of attacks from Sindh Raja Dahir on ships of Muslims and their imprisonment of Muslim men and women. They had earlier unsuccessfully sought to gain control of the route, via the Khyber Pass, from the Kabul Shahi of Gandhara. But by taking Sindh, Gandhara's southern neighbor, they were able to open a second front against Gandhara, a feat they had, on one occasion, attempted before. According to Wink, Umayyad interest in the region was galvanized by the operation of the Meds, a tribe of Scythians living in Sindh, and others. Meds had pirated upon Sassanid shipping in the past, from the mouth of the Tigris to the Sri Lankan coast, in their Baware and now were able to prey on Arab shipping from their bases at Kutch, Dabal and Kathiawar. At the time, Sindh was the wild frontier region of Al-Hind, inhabited mostly by semi-nomadic tribes whose activities disturbed much of the western Indian Ocean. Muslim sources insist that it was these persistent activities along increasingly important Indian trade routes by Dabal pirates and others which forced the Arabs to subjugate the area, in order to control the seaports and maritime routes of which Sindh was the nucleus, as well as, the overland passage. During Hajjaj's governorship, the Meds of Dabal in one of their raids had kidnapped Muslim women traveling from Sri Lanka to Arabia, thus providing a casus belli to the rising power of the Umayyad Caliphate that enabled them to gain a foothold in the Makran, Baluchistan and Sindh regions. Also cited as a reason for this campaign was the policy of providing refuge to Sassanids fleeing the Arab advance and to Arab rebels from the Umayyad consolidation of their rule. These Arabs were imprisoned later on by the governor Dibal Partab Ray. A letter written by an Arab girl who escaped from the prison of Partab Ray asked Hajjaj bin Yusuf for help. When Hajjaj asked to hear for the release of prisoners and compensation, the latter refused on the ground that he had no control over those. Al Hajjaj sent Muhammad bin Qasim for action against the Sindh in 711. The Mawali, new non Arab converts, who were usually allied with Al Hajjaj's political opponents and thus were frequently forced to participate in battles on the frontier of the Umayyad Caliphate such as Kabul, Sindh and Transoxania. An actual push into the region had been out of favor as an Arab policy since the time of the Rashidun Caliph Umar bin Khattab, who upon receipt of reports of it being an inhospitable and poor land, had stopped further expeditionary ventures into the region. The campaign Hajjaj had put more care and planning into this campaign than the second campaign under Badil bin Tufa. Hajjaj superintended this campaign from Kufa by maintaining close contact with Muhammad bin Qasim in the form of regular reports for which purpose special messengers were deputed between Basra and Sindh. The army which departed from Shiraz in 710 CE under Muhammad bin Qasim was 6,000 Syrian cavalry and detachments of Mawali from Iraq. At the borders of Sindh he was joined by an advance guard and 6,000 camel riders and later reinforcements from the governor of Makran transferred directly to Dabal by sea along with five catapults Manjaniks. The army that eventually captured Sindh would later be swelled by the Gurjars and Meds as well as other irregulars that heard of successes in Sindh. 
When Muhammad bin Qasim passed through Makran while raising forces, he had to resubdue the rest of Umayyad towns of Fanazbur and Arman Bela the first town assaulted was Dabal and upon the orders of al-Hajjaj, he exacted a bloody retribution on Dabal by giving no quarter to its residents or priests and destroying its great temple. From Dabal the Arab army then marched north taking towns such as Narun and Sedusan peacefully, often using their components. Additionally one-fifth of the booty including slaves were dispatched to Hajjaj and the Caliph. The conquest of these towns was accomplished easily, however, Raja Dahir's armies being prepared on the other side of the Indus were yet to be fought. In preparation to meet them, Muhammad bin Qasim moved back to Narun to resupply and receive reinforcements sent by Hajjaj. Camped on the east bank of the Indus, Qasim sent emissaries and bargained with the river jats and boatmen. Upon securing the aid of Mocha Basaya, the king of the island of Bet, Muhammad bin Qasim crossed over the river where he was joined by the forces of the Thakur of Bada and the western jats. At Ar-Rur he was met by Dahir's forces and the eastern jats in battle. Dahir died in the battle, his forces were defeated and a triumphant Muhammad bin Qasim took control of Sindh. In the wake of the battle enemy soldiers were put to death, but not artisans, merchants or farmers, and Dahir and his chiefs, the daughters of princes, and the usual fifth of the booty and slaves was sent on to Hajjaj. Soon the capitals of the other provinces, Brahmanabad, Alor A -R -O -R, and Multan, were captured alongside other in between towns with only light Muslim casualties. Usually after a siege of a few weeks or months the Arabs gained a city through the intervention of heads of mercantile houses with whom subsequent treaties and agreements would be settled. After battles all fighting men were executed and their wives and children enslaved in considerable numbers and the usual fifth of the booty and slaves were sent to Hajjaj. The general populace was encouraged to carry on with their trades and taxes and tributes settled. The conquest of Sindh, in modern day Pakistan, although costly, was major gain for the Umayyad Caliphate. However, further gains were halted by Hindu kingdoms during the caliphate campaigns in India. The Arabs tried to invade India but they were defeated by the North Indian king Nagabada of the Gurhara Pratihara dynasty and by the South Indian emperor Vikramaditya II of the Chalukya dynasty in the early 8th century. After the failure of further expeditions on Kathiawar, the Arab chroniclers admit that the Caliph Mahdi gave up the project of conquering any part of India. Military and political strategy The military strategy had been outlined by al Hajjaj in a letter sent to Muhammad bin Qasim. My ruling is given, kill anyone belonging to the al-i harb combatants, arrest their sons and daughters for hostages and imprison them. Whoever does not fight against us, grant them aman and settle their tribute amwal as dima protected person. The Arabs' first concern was to facilitate the conquest of Sindh with the fewest casualties while also trying to preserve the economic infrastructure. Towns were given two options, submit to Islamic authority peacefully or be attacked by force Anwatan, with the choice governing their treatment upon capture. The capture of towns was usually accomplished by means of a treaty with a party from among the enemy, who were then extended special privileges and material rewards. There were two types of such treaties. Sul or Ahde Wasik capitulation and Amman surrender peace. Among towns and fortresses that were captured through force of arms, Muhammad bin Qasim performed executions of all I Harb fighting men as part of his military strategy, whose surviving dependents were enslaved, where resistance was strong, prolonged, and intensive, often resulting in considerable Arab casualties. Muhammad bin Qasim's response was dramatic, inflicting 6,000 deaths at Rawar, between 6,000 and 26,000 at Brahmanabad, 4,000 at Iskalanda, and 6,000 at Multan. Conversely, in areas taken by Sul, such as Armabal, Nirun, and Aror, resistance was light and few casualties occurred. Sul appeared to be Muhammad bin Qasim's preferred mode of conquest, the method used for more than 60% of the towns and tribes recorded by Baladuri and the Chach Nama. At one point, he was actually berated by al-Hajjaj for being too lenient. 
Meanwhile, the common folk were often pardoned and encouraged to continue working. Al Hajjaj ordered that this option not be granted to any inhabitant of Dabal, yet Qasim still bestowed it upon certain groups and individuals. After each major phase of his conquest, Muhammad bin Qasim attempted to establish law and order in the newly conquered territory by showing religious tolerance and incorporating the ruling class, the Brahmins and Shramanas, into his administration. Topic. Reasons for success Muhammad bin Qasim's success has been partly ascribed to Dahir being an unpopular Hindu king ruling over a Buddhist majority who saw Chach of Alor and his kin as usurpers of the Rai dynasty. This is attributed to having resulted in support being provided by Buddhists and inclusion of rebel soldiers serving as valuable infantry in his cavalry heavy force from the Jat and Meds. Brahmin, Buddhist, Greek, and Arab testimony however can be found that attests towards amicable relations between the adherents of the two religions up to the 7th century, along with this were Superior military equipment, such as siege engines and the Mongol bow Troop discipline and leadership The concept of jihad as a morale booster Religion, the widespread belief in the prophecy of Muslim success the Samanis being persuaded to submit and not take up arms because the majority of the population was Buddhist who were dissatisfied with their rulers, who were Hindu. The laboring under disabilities of the Lohana Jats. Defections from among Dahir's chiefs and nobles. <laughs> Administration by Muhammad bin Qasim After the conquest, Muhammad bin Qasim's task was to set up an administrative structure for a stable Muslim state that incorporated a newly conquered alien land, inhabited by non-Muslims. He adopted a conciliatory policy, asking for acceptance of Muslim rule by the natives in return for non-interference in their religious practice, so long as the natives paid their taxes and tribute. In return, the state provided protection to non-Muslim from any foreign attacks and enemies. He established Islamic Sharia law over the people of the region, however, Hindus were allowed to rule their villages and settle their disputes according to their own laws, and traditional hierarchical institutions, including the village headman and chieftains deacons were maintained. A Muslim officer called an emil was stationed with a troop of cavalry to manage each town on a hereditary basis everywhere taxes and tribute were settled and hostages taken. Occasionally this also meant the custodians of temples. Non-Muslim natives were excused from military service and from payment of the religiously mandated tax system levied upon Muslims called zakat. The tax system levied upon them instead was the jizya, a progressive tax, being heavier on the upper classes and light for the poor. In addition, 3% of government revenue was allocated to the Brahmins. Topic: <laughs> Incorporation of ruling elite into administration. During his administration, Hindus and Buddhists were inducted into the administration as trusted advisors and governors. A Hindu, Kaksa, was at one point the second most important member of his administration. Dahir's prime minister and various chieftains were also incorporated into the administration. <laughs> Jat clashes with Muhammad bin Qasim Significant medieval Muslim chronicles such as the Chachnama, Zainal Akbar and Tariq i Baihaqi have recorded battles between the Jats and forces of Muhammad bin Qasim. <laughs> Treatment of Jats When Muhammad bin Qasim invaded Sindh, he encountered Jats and all Hindus were termed Jats by the foreign invaders. The narrative in the Chach Nama conveys that Chach of Alor humiliated the Jats and Lohanas. He compelled them to agree to only carry sham swords, to wear no undergarments of shawl, velvet or silk, only wear silk outer garments provided they were red or black in color, to put no saddles on their horses, to take their dogs when they went out, to furnish guides and spies and carry firewood for the royal kitchen. Qasim maintained these regulations, declaring that the Jats resembled the savages of Persia and the mountains. He also fixed their tribute. Jats of Ghassel who had submitted to the Arab rule garrisoned the Sagara and the island of Bait. Topic. 
Topic: <inaudible> Religion. Majority of historians like Eliot, Cousins, Majumdar and Vaidya have the general consensus that there was coercive conversion during his reign and destruction of temples was a reflection of the more basic religiously motivated intolerance. Facts also corroborated by various Islamic sources such as Chachnama, Zainal Akbar and Tariq i Baihaqi. Lane Poole writes that, "...as a rule Muslim government was at once tolerant and economic. The preference of collection of jizya over the conversion to Islam is a major economic motivator. Hindus and Buddhists who were classified as dhimmis had to pay mandatory jizya, a form of ransom money. Jizya is normally higher than the zakat to be paid by Muslims. Contrastingly preferential treatment was given to a small number of people who were converted to Islam by exempting them from jizya in lieu of paying the zakat. Qasim fixed zakat at 10% of the agricultural produce. Dhimmis, who are given a second-class status and often treated harshly, have to pay the mandatory jizya. Dhimmis have to endure more restrictions and lesser rights than Muslims. A religious Islamic office, Sadru i Islam al Afal, was created to oversee the secular governors. The native hereditary elites were reappointed with the title of Rana. According to Yohannan Friedman, Qasim declared that the Brahmins of Brahmanabad were good people, while proselytization occurred. Given the social dynamics of areas of Sindh conquered by Muslim, the spread of Islam was slow and took centuries. No mass conversions to Islam took place and some temples escaped destruction, such as the Sun Temple of Multan on payment of jizya. In the Arab settlers controlled areas of Sindh and Multan, conversion to Islam occurred only slowly, not on a massive scale. Majority of the population continued to remain Hindu who had to pay the jizya imposed by the Muslim state. Topic: <laughs> Death. Muhammad bin Qasim had begun preparations for further expansions when Hajjaj died, as did Caliph al-Walid I, who was succeeded by Sulayman ibn Abd al-Malik, who then took revenge against all who had been close to Hajjaj. Sulayman owed political support to opponents of Hajjaj and so recalled both of Hajjaj's successful generals Qutaybah bin Muslim and Qasim. He also appointed Yazid ibn al-Muhalib, once tortured by Hajjaj and a son of al-Muhalib ibn Abi Sufra, as the governor of Fars, Kerman, Makran, and Sindh. He immediately placed Qasim in chains. There are two different accounts regarding the details of Qasim's fate. According to al Baladari, a 9th century historian, Qasim was killed due to a family feud with the governor of Iraq. After the death of the Caliph al Walid I, his brother Sulayman ibn Abd al Malik became the new Caliph. Sulayman became hostile against Qasim because apparently he had followed the order of Hajjaj to declare Sulayman's right of succession void in all territories conquered by him. When Qasim received the news of the death of Hajjaj, he returned to Aror. Qasim was later arrested under the orders of the caliph by the successor governor of Sindh, Yazid ibn Kabisha as Sasaki, who worked under the new governor of Iraq, Yazid ibn al-Muhalib, and the new fiscal manager, Salah ibn Abd ar rahman Salah, whose brother was executed by Hajjaj, tortured Qasim and his relatives to death. The account of his death by al baladari is very brief compared to the one in Chachanama. The Chachnama narrates a tale in which Qasim's demise is attributed to the daughters of King Dahir who had been taken captive during the campaign. Upon capture they had been sent on as presents to the Khalifa for his harem in the capital Baghdad however Baghdad wasn't built yet and the actual capital was Damascus. The account relates that they then tricked the caliph into believing that Muhammad bin Qasim had violated them before sending them on and as a result of this subterfuge, Muhammad bin Qasim was wrapped and stitched in oxen hides, and returned to Syria, which resulted in his death en route from suffocation. This narrative attributes their motive for this subterfuge to securing vengeance for their father's death. Upon discovering this subterfuge, the caliph is recorded to have been filled with remorse and ordered the sisters buried alive in a wall. Controversy There is controversy regarding the conquest and subsequent conversion of Sindh. This is usually voiced in two antagonistic perspectives viewing Qasim's actions, his conquest, as described by Stanley Lane Poole, in Medieval India published in 1970 by Haskell House Publishers Limited, was liberal. He imposed the customary poll tax, took hostages for good conduct and spared people's lives and lands. 
He even left their shrines undesecrated, the temples, he proclaimed, shall be inviolate, like the churches of the Christians, the synagogues of the Jews and altars of the Magians. In the same text, however, it is mentioned that, "...occasional desecration of Hindu fanes took place but such demonstrations were probably rare sops to the official conscience." H. M. Eliot considered him to be, "...better," than other invaders, indulging in, "...much less, wanton sacrifice of life than was freely indulged in by most of the ruthless bigots who have propagated the same faith elsewhere." He considers the unwanted toleration to have probably arisen from the small number of the invading force, as well as from ignorance of civil institutions. However, destruction of temples and civilian massacres still took place. Coercive conversion has been attributed to early historians such as Eliot, Cousins, Majumdar, and Vaidya. They hold the view that the conversion of Sindh was necessitated. Qasim's numerical inferiority is said to explain any instances of apparent religious toleration, with the destruction of temples seen as a reflection of the more basic, religiously motivated intolerance. Voluntary conversion has been attributed to Thomas W. Arnold and modern Muslim historians such as Habib and Qureshi. They believe that the conquest was largely peaceful, and the conversion entirely so, and that the Arab forces enacted liberal, generous, and tolerant policies. These historians mention the praiseworthy conduct of Arab Muslims", and attribute their actions to a superior civilizational complex. Various polemical perceptions of Islam, Hinduism and Buddhism are also reflected in this debate. Eliot perceived Islam as a religion of terror, devastation, murder and rapine, where the conquering Arabs were characterized as ruthless bigots and furious zealots, motivated by plunder and proselytism. The period of Qasim's rule has been called by U.T. Thacker, the darkest period in Sindh history, with the records speaking of massive forced conversions, temple destruction, slaughters and genocides, the people of Sindh, described as inherently pacifist due to their Hindu, Buddhist religious inclinations, had to adjust to the conditions of barbarian inroad. On one extreme, the Arab Muslims are seen as being compelled by religious stricture to conquer and forcibly convert sin, but on the other hand, they can be seen as being respectful and tolerant of non-Muslims as part of their religious duty, with conversion being facilitated by the vitality, equality and morals of the Islamic religion. Citations of towns taken either violently or bloodlessly, reading back into Arab Sindh information belonging to a later date and dubious accounts such as those of the forcible circumcision of Brahmins at Dabal or Qasim's consideration of Hindu sentiment in forbidding the slaughter of cows are used as examples for one particular view or the other. Some historians strike a middle ground, saying that Qasim was torn between the political expediency of making peace with the Hindus and Buddhists, having to call upon non-Muslims to serve under him as part of his mandate to administer newly conquered land, and orthodoxy by refraining from seeking the cooperation of infidels. It is contended that Qasim may have struck a middle ground, conferring the status of dhimmi upon the native Sindhis and permitting them to participate in his administration, but treating them as non-citizens, i.e. in the Khilafat, but not of it. <laughs> Legacy Qasim's presence and rule was very brief. His conquest for the Umayyads brought Sindh into the orbit of the Muslim world. After the conquest of Sindh, Qasim adopted the Hanafi school of Sharia law which regarded polytheists such as Hindus, Buddhists and Jains as dhimmis and people of the book, allowing them religious freedom as long as they continued to pay the tax known as jizya. This approach would prove critical to the way Muslim rulers ruled in India over the next centuries. During the troubles between the Abbasid Caliphate and the Umayyad Caliphate the local emirs shook off all allegiance to the caliphs and by the 10th century the region the Umayyad control was destroyed by Mahmud of Ghazni. The Abbasids took this opportunity to set up their own government in Sindh. The Sumra dynasty ruled Sindh as the functionary of the Abbasid Caliphate until the siege of Baghdad 1258. Mansura was the capital of the Sumra dynasty. Coastal trade in a Muslim colony in Sindh allowed for cultural exchanges and the arrival of Sufi missionaries to expand Muslim influence. 
From Dabal, which remained an important port until the 12th century, commercial links with the Persian Gulf and the Middle East intensified as Sindh became the hinge of the Indian Ocean trade and overland passway. Muhammad bin Qasim is often referred to as the first Pakistani according to Pakistan Studies curriculum. Muhammad Ali Jinnah also acclaimed Muhammad bin Qasim and claimed that the Pakistan movement started when the first Muslim put his foot on the soil of Sindh, the gateway of Islam in India. Yam e Bab ul Islam is observed in Pakistan, in honor of Muhammad bin Qasim. Port Qasim, Pakistan's second major port, is named in honor of Muhammad bin Qasim. Bagh i Bne Qasim is the largest park in Karachi, Sindh, Pakistan, named in honor of Muhammad bin Qasim. Ibn e Qasim Bagh Stadium, Multan is a multi use stadium named after Muhammad bin Qasim. The Pakistan Naval Station Qasim, or PNS Qasim, is the major naval special operations base for the amphibious special operations forces in the Pakistan Navy, named after Muhammad bin Qasim. Bin Qasim Town in Karachi is named after Muhammad bin Qasim. Muhammad bin Qasim Road, Avenue in Karachi is named after Muhammad bin Qasim. Muhammad bin Qasim Library in Sujawal, Thatta is named after Muhammad bin Qasim. See also Jat people in Islamic history Muslim conquests on the Indian subcontinent Caliphate campaigns in India Qutaiba bin Muslim Abdullah Shah Ghazi Sheikh Habib al-Raee Footnotes <laughs>